Hey, it's Greg Stanley. If you're listening to this podcast, you know I love everything automotive. This passion has expanded to include being a car specialist consultant for RM Sotheby's. So if you need assistance buying or consigning a collector car at any one of our online or live auctions, including Scottsdale, Amelia Island, or Monterey, you can reach one of our car specialists at rmsotheby's.com or you can email me directly at gstanley at rmsotheby's.com. I just want to give a quick thanks to Euro Classics for sponsoring this episode. Euro Classics is all about collector cars, from servicing your new BMW M5 to prepping your Porsche for the racetrack to executing a total restoration on your favorite classic. They do it all from routine maintenance to performance upgrades to appraisals and everything in between. You can learn more about its owner, Dale Oaks, by listening to episode number 65 of this podcast. And you can find Euro Classics in the Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana service area and online at euroclassics.com. Classics, C L A S S I X dot com. This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all my listeners and auto enthusiasts. Hey, it's Greg Stanley with the Collector Car Podcast, and things were electric at Elkhart, to say the least. Elkhart, Indiana was hopping last weekend as part of the RM Sotheby's Elkhart Collection Sale. So I'm going to read off the headlines, but then I'm going to give you a behind-the-scenes deep dive into some of the data. So it's pretty interesting. Okay, so what are the headlines? RM Sotheby's live auction of the Elkhart collection sees exceptional results with $44.4 million in total sales and 100% sell-through. Over 240 cars and a wide selection of memorabilia offered almost entirely without reserve at two-day auction. So there are a lot of headlines here. Uh, If you were hoping for a deal on a toolbox or a tool cabinet or some furniture, you were out of luck. Because basically it went for retail price or higher than retail price. I'm sure there were a couple of deals in there. There was an Auto Bianchia neon sign. I wish I had bid it on. It sold for about 250 bucks, but I was unable to do so. Uh, there were a couple a couple deals there if you really look, but things were very very strong. I think the predominant reason for that is people are tired of being cooped up. I think COVID has folks thinking, you know what, you don't live forever, so let's enjoy our money while we can. And it was definitely uh, very active for the entire weekend. So those are the headlines. And now I'm actually, before I, I dig into the numbers, I forgot a couple of announcements. So one announcement is on my website, thecollectorcarpodcast.com, soon I will have a little button there that you can click called What's My Car Worth? Now, this is a show that used to be on, I think, Velocity, and it was one of my favorite shows. Basically, Keith Martin and a co-host would take a car, kind of go over it from a condition perspective. You know, is it a concourse grade one? Is it a two, like a really nice show car? Is it a three, a very nice driver? Is it a four, a daily driver? Or is it a five and needs some work? And then they would give what they think the car is worth. So I'm going to do the virtual version of that. Once I have 10 or so interesting collectible cars, I will do an episode dedicated to your cars. So just go to the collectorcarpodcast.com, find the little button that says, what's my car worth? And we will do that in the future. Something else I wanted to give you a heads up on is I will begin live streaming episodes. So you will see the unedited version. Now, these will only be versions such as this episode where it's just me talking If I have a guest, I want them to look the best that they possibly can, so I will edit those down. That will not be live streaming. Uh, It will strictly be when I'm covering all sorts of types of information. And I will be live streaming at some concourse shows in the future. If you have a really nice show and you would like for me to live stream at your show, just shoot me a note, greg at thecollectorcarpodcast.com. How does that work? Basically, it's like color commentary for a baseball game, except I will be talking about the car that are coming up to the award stage as they pass by. Hopefully you will be able to see them and hear them, hear the exhaust note, and the lo- learn a little bit more, some more fun facts about those cars as they approach the uh, to get their award. All right, now on to the details that I mentioned earlier. From the official announcement, there were 240 automobile lots. I, For my numbers, I have 236 because I took out some of the more utilitarian, not collector car lots. 
to just try to keep it more to the collector car market. And what's interesting is of those 236 cars, 98 of them actually went over the high estimate. I feel like these estimates were right on uh, for the automobiles. I, I, I think they were realistic, even aspirational on a couple of cars, which I'll talk to here in a second. But even so, 42% of them actually went over the high estimate, which just shows you the appetite that's out there for high quality collector cars. So the record sales, I'll go over the record sales. Now these are not verified. These are record sales as discussed in the room with other experts. Uh, one of them is verified because the president of the national club was there. So the first one is an interesting one on our record sales. It's a 1936 white model 706 Glacier National Park tour bus. Now this was gorgeous, huge red tour bus from the 1930s. The estimate on this one was 100, 100 to $150,000. It sold for $405,000. That is just insane. So that is a huge record price for a bus, and it was $305,000 higher than the low estimate. The second one, and I don't know if this is a record or not, but I'm a Mustang lover, a Shelby fan. I've never heard of one sell for this much, but 1966 Shelby GT350H, the Hertz model, so approximately 1,000 of these cars were built. This was a black with gold stripes, which most of them are, but it was a four-speed car, which only the first 80 or so. So that is what drove the price up. The estimate on this was 225 to 250, and it sold for 240. So it sold within the estimate range. I just thought that was a really high number for not only just a GT350 from a, from 1966. Typically, I see those tra trade in the 175 to 200 range. But the Hertz cars typically sell for a little less because they were quote-unquote rental cars. So that one surprised me. Now this one is a record, a 1950 Land Rover Series 1 Zero car. So one of the very first ones, if not the first one. Estimate was ninety dollars to $120,000. The high bid was $215,000. So over twice what the low estimate was. All right, this next one is why it's on the cover art for this podcast 2011 tesla roadster now this one only this roadster only had about three thousand miles on it estimate was sixty to eighty thousand dollars i'm sure all of you are saying that seems extremely strong for a used car from 2011 but how often can you find a first generation tesla that has low miles and this thing rang the bell at one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars so there is a collector car market for hybrids, and it is taking off. So that was more than double the low estimate as well. This next one I have in here because everybody was drooling over this car. It's a 1965 Lotus Cortina. Ford Cortina Lotus Mark I Estate Custom. So it was a wagon. Everybody was drooling over this car. The estimate was 35 to 50. It sold for 90, so well above twice the low estimate, almost twice the high estimate. And then this last one is the one that was verified as a record price, a 1961 AMC Metropolitan Convertible, the best in the world, I was told by the president of the National Club. The estimate was forty to $60,000, and it sold for $70,000. Okay, so those are the record cars from the sale. If I missed one, shoot me a note. I would love to know. All right, let's go over the top 10 sales. So these are the high-dollar cars. Now, a lot of question was surrounding the continuation Jaguars. There were three of them. It was They were the only three cars that actually had a reserve on them for the auction. Would they hit within the estimate or close enough uh, so that that reserve will be list, lifted? And are they true collectibles? Do folks want continuation cars that were made by the factory? So we got our answer here. So the number one sale of the auction was a 1952 Ferrari 225 Berlinetta. Uh, the estimate was 2.5 to 3.5 million, so just over the low estimate, 2.255 million. That was the high sale of the auction, and it was at no reserve. That's pretty aggressive. All right, the next one's a 1953 Fiat 8V Supersonic. Estimate was 1.75 million to 2.2. It sold just above low estimate at 1.85 million. All right, continuation car, 1957 Jaguar XKSS. Estimate was 1.5 to 2 million, sold at 1.8, so a little bit above mid estimate. Next one is a 1955 Cooper Jaguar Mark II, one of just a handful built. Estimate was 2 to 2.5 million. That one fell underneath, it hit 1.6 million. 
All right, then the next continuation car is a 1963 Jaguar E-Type Lightweight. Estimate was 2.7 to 2.25. That was under low estimate at 2.5. And then we have a 1955 Mercedes Gullwing, and that was 1.4 to 1.6. Sold just under low estimate at 1.35. And then the last continuation, 1955 Jaguar D-Type, my favorite of the three. The estimate was 1 to $1.5 million, and it sold for 1.2. So I would say that all of those are collectibles. They're holding their value. They haven't decreased at all. And a couple of these did increase because the estimates were even higher than the initial price of the car. All right, two more from the top 10 sales. 1969 Lamborghini Miura P400S. Estimate was 1.2 to 1.4. Sold a little bit under estimate at 1.05 million. And then the last one was pretty interesting. Uh, the Toyota 2000 GT. Estimate was seven hundred to eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and it just was under high estimate at eight twenty five. Now, just for note, these do not include the buyer's premium, so you would add ten percent to all of these numbers to get the absolute final price. So we just talked about record sales and the top ten sales. Well, how about some of the top bargains of the sale? There were some bargains to be had. Now, a few of these I mentioned that Goldwing was a bargain about forty five grand under estimate. Uh, I'll go with some big dollar ones here. All right, this one surprised me. This is the one I was texting some friends, telling them they need to buy this car. A 1937 Cord 812 Supercharged Cabriolet estimate was, the low estimate was 325, and it sold for 95 grand under that. So that was quite a bargain. Uh, let's see, what else have I not mentioned? Actually, all the other ones I've already mentioned, they were all the ones in the top 10 that fell a little bit beneath the low estimate. Those were some pretty good bargains, pretty high price bargains, but they were still bargains nonetheless. Okay, now I wanted to check out which cars were the highest over low estimate. So these are ones that, you know, maybe the low estimate was 100 grand. How did they fare above and beyond the low estimate? So one I've mentioned already was that white model 706 Glacier National Park bus. Uh, that was, the low estimate was 100 grand and it sold for $405,000. So that was over 200% above the low estimate. The next one's the Jaguar 1957 Jaguar XK SS continuation car. That one was 15% above low estimate. So uh, that was pretty high. Uh, the next one is the D-type continuation. That was 13% above low estimate. Now this one really surprised, I think, a lot of folks in the room. I'm not quite sure what the year was, but it was a Impala NASCAR that was actually raced by Dale Earnhardt Jr. So the estimate was 80 grand to 100 grand. And it sold for $240,000. That thing just kept on going. So showing uh, quite a bit of desire for NASCAR collectibles. That was 160% over low estimate. And the last one I have is a 1930 Rolls-Royce Phantom II shooting brake. The low estimate was 120 and it sold for 135 I'm sorry, it sold for $255,000. So that was 84.4% above the low estimate. So it was really insane. We did have a handful of cars that sold significantly above their high estimate. Uh, let's see, the one we've talked about before, the bus, uh, that was 170% over the high estimate. The Earnhardt Juniors was very high. The shooting brake as well. Uh, the two cars that haven't been mentioned yet is the Land Rover Car Zero. Well, we did mention that earlier, but that was actually, let's see, the high estimate was $120,000, and the bid final hammer price was two hundred and fifteen. dollars so that was 95 grand over high estimate. And then the last one was really interesting. It was a Hot Rod Roadster Custom. The estimate was 150 to 200 and it sold for 265. So it was 65 grand over the high estimate. So very strong numbers even across the uh, one American Hot Rod that was present. So I went even deeper by looking at the brands and where they were sold. So I went into three buckets, American, European and Asian. So I basically looked how the results compared to the low estimate and see how strong they were. Now, all this is the basis that the estimates were pretty accurate, and I feel like they really were. So from an American brand perspective, there were 54 lots. The low estimate was 5.4 million. They sold for 6.7 million. So that's 24% higher than the low estimate, showing that they were pretty strong. The European brands, there were 162 European brands, the low estimate was 28.2 million. They sold for 29.1 million. The difference, only 3.3%. So there wasn't as much of 
a buying frenzy when it came to the European cars. At least that's how I decipher this. And the last one's very interesting. The Asian cars, there are only 16 of them, 1.2 million, and they sold for 1.6 million. So really strong. They oversold by 36.6% when compared to the low estimate. So the way I read this is Asian cars are very hot. American cars, depending on the cars, uh, sold very well at this auction. And then European cars sold well, but they weren't uh, going above expectations. Okay, I went even deeper. Now we're going into market trends by decade. Believe it or not, there were 11 decades represented in this collection. From the 1900s, there was only one lot, (laughs) and yet it sold $70,000 under the low estimate, so it sold 21% under expectations. In the 1910s, there were two lots, and they sold $40,000 under estimate, which equated to 11% under low estimate. And then things got a little bit better in the 1920s. We had six lots from the 1920s. They sold $137,000 over the low estimate for all of the cars. That was 18% above the low estimate. The 1930s, even stronger. 13 cars sold 30% over the low estimate. So things were really hopping on the cars from the 1930s. 1940s, there were 10 cars, and they were 10% over the low estimate. 1950s, this is interesting, there were 59 cars, and they actually sold under the low estimate for all of the cars, down slightly 1.6%. So those did not meet expectations and actually declined or performed underneath expectations by 1.6%. 1960s, there were 79 cars uh, representing 4.7 million. Hammer price was five, or low estimate, hammer price was 52 So that was almost 10% above low estimate. In the 1970s, 29 cars, 23% above low estimate. And now here's where the 80s are starting to come into their own. 1980s, there were only five cars, but they were 86% above low estimate. They should have hammered for around 200 and, I'm sorry, should have hammered at 148. And they actually hammered for $308,000. Insane. All right, two more decades. The 1990s, there were eight cars, and they hammered 30%, 29.2% above low estimates, so that was really strong. And then in the 2000s, we had 20 cars, including a couple of McLarens, and those hammered 21.4% above low estimate. So when you look at this, the big winner was the 1980s at 86%, and coming in second was the 1930s at 30.2%, above low estimate, followed by the 1990s and then the 1970s. Unfortunately, the biggest loser of this entire exercise was the 1900s, the 1910s, and the 1950s. All right, so what does all this mean? All this information, well, if the estimates are off, it doesn't mean a lot, but I think they were accurate. I think they were on. So this does give a little bit of a snapshot as far as what's going out there in the collector car market. First off, folks were in a mood to buy. That is for sure. There was a ton of activity. Talking to one of the other car specialists, Donnie Gold, who's been around for 30 years, he said he had not seen that amount of activity in bidding frenzy in at least 10 years. I think folks uh, see COVID as uh, something that puts a little bit of mortality in your perspective from a day in and day out perspective. And people want to enjoy their cars now because that's one of the few things you can do while we are all going through this craziness. Asian cars continue to move strong in the market, like I said before, overachieving low estimate by 36.6%. People will pay record prices for the best. I referenced a couple cars there, including the Nash Metropolitan. And the 1980s are here. It's a small base we had, but those results were insane. And then there is a collector car market for hybrids. Just witness that Tesla and how that went kind of nuts. So folks want what is rare, what is iconic, what has changed the industry, and nothing has changed the industry more right now than electric and hybrid cars. So it's a game changer. People are going to pay up for early ones with low mileage that are in great condition, and that's exactly what this car was. So as always, thanks for joining me this week, and I will talk to all of you next week. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast.